Uh, tonight, we're going to start the evening with video highlighting our incredible schools, teachers, administrators, and families. A big thank you to filmmakers and Burbank Unified School District parents, Jen and Rick Serena, for donating their time to create this fabulous film. And stay tuned after the video for a discussion with our panel. I would like to introduce them to you now. We're pleased to welcome BUSD Superintendent, Dr. Matt Hill, our school board president, Charlene Tabbitt, Disney Elementary dual immersion teacher, Hildy Garcia, John Muir Middle School drama teacher, Stephen James, and John Burroughs High School math teacher and ASB advisor, Jessica Pulaski. Thank you for sharing your time and expertise to engage our BOSD families. And a big thank you to our sponsors for making this night possible. A special thanks to Swainer Hardware, the City of Burbank, and the Burbank Water and Power for being our innovator sponsors. And a continued shout out of gratitude to both Disney and Warner Brothers who are consistent and generous community partners for BOSD students. Now, let's enjoy the show. Welcome to this year's State of the Schools. I'm Matt Hill, Superintendent of the Burbank Unified School District. I'm Charlene Tabbitt, President of Board of Education for the Burbank Unified School District. On behalf of our 21 schools, over 14,000 students, and 1,700 employees, we welcome you to this event. We look forward to sharing some of the highlights from this past year, as well as our goals for the future. Whether you're a new family to BUSD or a multi-generation old school like myself, a business partner, or a community member who's just interested in what's happening in our schools, we welcome you. As we all know, we're here for our students. So this year we're going to have the students lead the way. So I'm going to hand the baton off to the students, so enjoy the show. Thanks Matt and Char. The first item on our agenda is to find out what do you like about school. What I like about school is all the fun activities and learning. What do I love about school? I love teaching. I absolutely love teaching. Do we have enough time to talk about all the things I love about school? The best part about school that I adore and love, that I get to see everyday growth and social skills being created before my very eyes. What I love about school is the fact that I get to learn new things every day and see my friends. And I love my awesome teachers. Okay. What makes Burbank School so special? I always ask at the beginning of the year, how many of your parents went to this school? Always hands. How many of your grandparents? Every year, there's always a few. People stick around. They stay. They build that community. And I really enjoy that aspect. Burbank is a very unique, special place. And it shows every day, inside and outside the classrooms. The families know each other. And it's a really welcoming environment. I always tell people when I meet them that it's a small community, but it has all the niceties of a big city. So it's, it just feels like a, a wonderful community to be part of. We're a family. We know one another. We can collaborate with one another. There's just such a strong bond between everybody, and it's nice to know that there's like people who care and really want to like help out in the district. You see in some districts, some communities, arts is an add-on after the fact. That's not the case here in Burbank. Arts are embedded in the curriculum that we have here. Our teachers are being innovative every single day. It makes education fun and builds that skill set so that our students can adapt. I love music and I love to sing, I love to dance, I love to act and I'm just really excited because I love to do all that stuff and I can do it here. I really truly believe that the arts really make a difference in our students' lives. Um, I've been here for a long time so I've actually been able to see firsthand. 
When students do not have extra activities like art, like music, dance, science, it, it takes away from their love of school. And I want children to love school because education is so important. And what role does the Arts and Education Foundation play in all this? As most people know, California it, schools are incredibly underfunded. Um, and with the failure of Measure I to pass two times here in Burbank, we, we need more money. And so that's where BAAF hopes to come in and with your help, fill in those gaps and we can help teachers with the things they can't get. The foundation is incredible. It not only raises money, but it advocates for the arts. It advocates for education. They are there to support and back up innovation. It brings such a rich culture into our schools. The grants that they have given throughout the years have given students opportunities that they may not have had otherwise. Hello, Burbank Arts and Education Foundation. I'm Eli Weiss. I'm part of the John Burroughs Tech Program. I'm here to show you some cool things here and kind of what we do around here. So let's go. So this is our tech teacher, Katrina. Hi, my name is Katrina Villarreal, and I'm the technical theater director here at Burroughs. I've worked for Disney. I've worked for Knott's Berry Farm. I've worked across the two theme parks for a while. I've been on two world tours. Ariana Grande, uh, the weekend. I've worked with Maggie Rogers. I've done a bunch of stuff here with the diff different production houses. And so yeah, she knows a thing or two about lights and she graduated from here. Also, our crew is great. That's probably why we won best in the nation in New York this year. And yeah, so that brings us now to our wonderful stage. This is where tech kids can tech around, singers can sing around, and actors can act around. And there are a lot of lights. No, really, there are a lot of lights. These are the spots. These are the studio commands. These are the stage lights. These are the rows. These are the X4s. Thank you, Burbank Arts and Education Foundation for those lights. And that, so you might be wondering how all this works. Well, that's where my brother comes in at the light board. Plenty of people run it, but he's helping us right now. So Aiden, how does all this stuff work? Well, Eli, I'd love to tell you all about the things that the light board can do. Uh, one of the things that uh, is like one of the basic functions of the light board is that you can basically bring down a submaster, which is, uh, brings down the intensity of a cue list, which also shuts down parameters like pan and tail, color, and all those things. Once you bring it back up, every single grand master control, 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 to the soundboard because I know how to I know how to do do sound too. Right. Oh. Oh. Well, if lighting or sound isn't your thing, there are plenty of other options in tech crew, like rigging. Whenever you see any of those set pieces flown in or out, or those curtains flown in and out during shows, or those lights hung up, that's all rigging's job. Second black leg flying out. Thank you. Backstage can be anything like rigging, or people setting up mics, or stage managers, or even master electricians. They basically stay back here in case anything goes wrong, technically. And these are the spots. Now there's plenty of other, other positions that we have in tech. And plenty of other things we do in tech group. That's just a few things I like about it. My favorite part of my job is seeing you guys work and seeing all the stuff that you've learned throughout the year and applying it to an actual show the way that your smiles are 
after the show ends is incredible because you guys know you've done a good job and you did it with minimal mistakes but it was still a beautiful show nonetheless and you guys have done like 55 shows this year and you've executed all of them perfectly and to everybody's delight i just want to thank you guys the burbank arts and education foundation for all the lighting that you guys allowed us to get through the grant these lights that are spotlighting me are a part of the grant we bought four more lights on top of that so five lights uh with everything that you guys have given us and we couldn't be more grateful the shows that these kids produced were beautiful because of it, and I couldn't do it without you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Burning Arts and Education Foundation and State of Schools to help me show you guys a bit about what we do here at John Burroughs Stage Tech. And yeah, that's it. And we're going to end this off with a bit of a light show here. So, uh, Aiden, this, this is it, right? This is the one. Uh, no, no, that's the right thing. Wait, wait, what? Wait, wait, what happened? While Eli finds his way out of the dark, let's take a look at a light bulb of a different kind. Hi, my name is Isola. I'm in eighth grade, and I'm going to be interviewing um, two students from Edison Elementary. Hi, my name is Kyla Wilson, and I am in fifth grade. Hi, my name is Deluca Sanchez, and I am also in fifth grade. So for first question, why do you think art is important for kids your age? Um, for, to have like creativity in their mind and really stress. What are you excited about tomorrow with the project? I'm very excited to see how he is going to, how he's going to arrange us and how it's going to look in the end. Regarding the art uh, project tomorrow, what are uh, some things you're excited about? Um, I'm excited we get to like dress up um, and we get to be like, we get to, like for part of it, we get to be like a, not light light bulb and then they're gonna we get to turn into a light bulb oh, why do you think art is important for kids well there's lots of different kinds of art and art that um, reflects what is happening to the planet that they might not see in the usual way sometimes art can reach people when their minds are open and it can kind of stick in their brain about, about what's happening when it's does when it's when it uh goes into their mind in an artistic way and kids never forget this these these sky art projects they remember them their whole life people um they were wearing like white shirts and then some yellow and then it was white first a white light bulb since our thing it was, was like a white turned light off bulb. and then the next photo was turned on with yeah yellow shirts. Wait, and everyone was yellow, wearing yellow shirts nico was on the top of the light bulb Let's hear about some more of those grants that were awarded last year. I'm Chris Mitchell. I'm a teacher at Huerta Middle School. I teach exploring engineering as well as digital media and computer classes on the wheel. This grant will allow me to introduce robotics into three more classes uh, this year and subsequent years. So it's going to be affecting several hundred kids a year. One of the things I like best about this program is that students, once they are exposed to engineering and coding, have lots of opportunities to pursue that in high school and college. My name is Eric Carter. I'm a teacher on special assignment with the Department of Special Education. Since the pandemic, technology has been infused with everything that we do in our curriculum instruction. And with that, I wanted to find some additional tools for our special ed students. So the grant is being used towards purchasing the licenses for these Google extensions that will help students access their curriculum instruction by removing some barriers that they may have in written expression and reading comprehension. It also is providing for professional development for our teaching staff who are new to using these Google extensions and tools for our students. My name is Erica Dent. I am a second grade teacher at Joaquin Miller Elementary School. I wrote the grant to bring in diverse guided reading books. That could mean main characters who are diverse culturally, linguistically, they have different family structures or differently abled children. Seeing different characters and different experiences will help enrich them and open up their eyes to people who are similar to them as well as different. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is very important to me. I'm a very proud child of two immigrant parents from Mexico. I was afforded a lot of opportunity and I learned at a very young age I was different. So as an educator, it's important that we embrace everyone's background, everyone's narrative, and it also allows us to be different and accept those differences. Being able to read 
different experiences through literature is allowing my students to understand and to step into someone else's shoes and see things through their eyes and see how not everything is just how they themselves have experienced it, but maybe I need to take other points of view into consideration. And so building that empathy goes forward into the community later on, since so many people stay in Burbank, that stays in our community to hopefully build more equity and inclusion and diversity and just general understanding of people. And so if we have those lessons now, I really feel like that's what helps us avoid the lack of charity, the lack of empathy, the lack of just compassion, which is what we need to have to survive as a society. One of the best things that Burbank School does is provide that, those kinds of school climates where students get to come in and not only feel included into a school culture, but then also be proud of who they are. Hello, my name is James Larigo, and I'm here with Liam Walmister, Sophia Wagner, Alexandria Walters. Is, do you think a name of a school is important? Um, sí, Dolores Huerta ha hecho muchas cosas para nuestra comunidad y para California, y estoy feliz que podemos representar ella en con una escuela. Do you think it is important to have art in public places? Um, I do think it's important to have art in public places because it can spark imagination and it's just a change of scenery sometimes to see some color. Pienso que es, uh, sí es importante tener a, a arte in, en lugares públicos porque inspira imaginación y es un cambio en escenario. And is, how does this mural of Dolores Huerta make you feel? Um, the mural definitely inspires me because of all the things she's done, and it kind of has inspired me to do stuff like that myself. Right now, we are giving tours to our incoming sixth graders, and that's my first stop, because I want them to see what Dolores Huerta represents, and it represents them. Oh my God, I'm gonna get emotional. Because <laughs> I don't want them to come into middle school feeling that they have to change who they are. I want them to come to middle school knowing that their culture, their language, their traditions are welcomed. There's a lot of things that kids cannot control. They can't control how many people live in their household. They can't control their parents' finances. They can't control who their parents are. But knowing how to express that or look for help so they can feel better inside or how to navigate those issues will reflect in their academics, in their personal life, in their growth. The community needs thriving adults to function properly and we need to raise those children in order to be those adults. Public schools are no longer just solely academic institutions. They are community institutions. They are expected <laughs> to take care of social emotional needs to feed children, to be there for childcare, to make sure that kids know how to make friends and know how to be decent human beings. We need, we need support. I believe companies and individuals should take a long look at what the mission of the foundation truly is. It's not just about raising money. There's a purpose behind what those dollars get used for. To engage, engage and, and inspire. inspire the community to, to invest, invest in meeting the diverse educational, educational needs of every, of, every of every BUSD student. I'd like to encourage everyone to be a part of our reoccurring donations. These donations consistently fill that bucket that we need in order to provide the programs and the adventures that we want our kids to have in BUSD. And now a message from Assembly Member Laura Friedman. Good evening, everyone. I'm Assembly Member Laura Friedman. It's so great to have an event that highlights the achievement of our public schools our students and our teachers, as well as the BUSD Board of Education's initiatives. I want to express my gratitude for all the hard work and the enthusiasm you all bring every day. Education isn't easy for anyone, but Burbank has a wonderful community that is truly invested in the education and success of our students. And that 
makes the experience so much more enriching and fun for everyone. Thank you to Burbank Arts and Education Foundation and BUSD for valuing equity, inclusion, and innovation, and for making sure that our students and teachers in Burbank have the support that they need to grow and thrive. The work that you all are doing is meaningful and essential to our collective well-being as Californians. Have a wonderful evening and keep up the fantastic work. Hi, I'm State Senator Anthony Portentino, and it's so great to be back to school. I just want to commend the Burbank Arts and Education Foundation for bringing us all together today, and those families out there who have their kids going to school in the wonderful Burbank Unified School District. What a great year it's going to be. We've had a trying time. We've turned the page. It's exciting. By the way, I'm jealous. My kids are out of K-12 education and out of the house, and I wish I was going through that experience again. So thank you, Burbank Arts and Education Foundation, the teachers, the administrators, the parents, the children, for being exciting as we go back to school. What a great day. What a great time to hear about the state of the schools in Burbank, and God bless everybody. Thank you, Senator Portentino. Let's take a look at what we can expect in the upcoming school year. This year's Burbank Unified School District's goals are to have career and college ready students. Two, students and staff will be physically, emotionally, and mentally healthy this year. Three, to hire and retain highly effective personnel. And finally, to have effective and efficient operations. Obviously, safety and the well-being of our students and staff is priority one, and we're going to continue to focus on that. But more importantly, this year we get to focus on teaching and learning, make that the center again to what we do. I'm excited to see all the innovations from our preschool classrooms all the way through our adult school classrooms. People come to Burbank in order to be a part of our schools. We need to keep that reputation in so that they know they are living in this expensive town, getting the best education for their kids and it's worth staying for. So our dreams for the future are continuing to look out there and find out what are the skill sets that our students need for the jobs of the future. We know many of these jobs don't exist today, but we need to make sure our students have the skill sets and the ability to adapt to a changing workforce. We continue to partner with our community colleges, Glendale as well as LA Valley Community College, to have dual enrollment classes where our students can leave high school with high school and college credit and get experience with hands-on partnerships. In addition, our beautiful partnerships with the Chamber, the studios, and other businesses in the city, so our students have pathways, whether it's our NAP academies, which can be finance, medical, engineering, animation, our students are getting the skills they need to thrive in the future. I'm looking forward to just seeing continued growth, and hopefully as a district and schools, we can continue to provide them with good resources that will help you know, our kids be successful and be productive members of society. We know that not everyone's going to go to college, but if they can see themselves doing something else, we're, done, we're doing a good job. I'm really excited about our new partnership with West Coast Customs. Ryan and his team worked with our adult school team and we are creating a one-of-a-kind academy where our high school recent graduates and our adult school students can get a hands-on experience at the site at West Coast Customs. This is something unique and innovative and it's another example of how Burbank's always leading the way in innovative ways to have our students career and college ready. Good evening, I'm Congressman Adam Schiff, proud representative of California's 28th Congressional District, which includes the wonderful city of Burbank. I want to offer my best wishes as you gather for the Burbank Arts and Education Foundation's 2022 State of the Schools event. Since 2020, when the Burbank Educational Foundation and the Burbank Arts for All Foundation merged, you have taken unprecedented steps to ensure that all students get a fabulous education and are exposed to the beauty of the arts. The COVID-19 pandemic took a toll on all of us and none more so than our children. But thanks to your efforts, our kids will be back in their classrooms and on campuses throughout the district, thriving the way it should be. I applaud everyone in the Burbank Arts and Education Foundation for your incredible work to provide our children with a strong multidisciplinary education. Thank you for all that you do for our students, and for our future. Thank you. Thanks, Representative Schiff. It's true. 
BAEF and BUSD is a great partnership. I am a proud member of the Burbank Unified School District. I am a proud advocate of this foundation. You don't have to contribute. You just have to advocate and learn about this foundation and what our school district is doing. I support BAEF because I believe in public school and I believe that it's our job, it's our community's job to educate our children. Like education is the great equalizer. And if we're not providing for our kids and we're not giving them an equitable experience throughout our schools, um, then we're not doing our job. And so I'm part of Burbank Arts and Education Foundation to make sure that all schools, all students are getting what they need. When we have a thriving school district, we have a thriving community. We need your monthly donation to continue our support of BUSD students. Go to baef.gives now. We invite you to continue this conversation with our webinar following this broadcast. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much again to Jen and Rick Serena for that beautiful film. And thank you to all the students and families and educators who did such a great job of lending their voices to this project. Thank you to our sponsors for their generous donations, which will be directly benefiting BUSD students. And we thank all of everyone here that's joining us here tonight. And for those who submitted questions to our panel, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen is where you can ask questions in real time, and we'll do our best to answer them here. And for if we're not able to, we will get those questions and answer them and get them out. So we're, we want to try to answer all your questions. The chat is disabled. If you want to view the film at a later time, you may go to our website at burbankartsanded.org. And this is just a quick reminder to all of our panelists, including myself, to not speak too quickly so our translators are able to keep up with our conversation. Thank you for the reminder. So our first question is for Dr. Hill, and it comes from an elementary school parent. And the question is, please provide an assessment as to district performance in comparison to other peer districts. Thank you, Brenda. And I just want to echo your thanks to everyone that created that amazing video. And I think that really highlights uh, what makes Burbank so special. So as you saw in the video, every single one of our schools has been named a California Distinguished School. Uh, we have gone through a pandemic where most districts have seen dramatic learning loss. Uh, official results aren't out yet, but we've started seeing preliminary data and in conversations with other superintendents of the region, Burbank Unified was able to actually accelerate in math and pretty much maintain our English learning scores. Now we know we're not satisfied with the work that we've already done. There's always more work because we wanna make sure that we're pushing to that next level. Uh, some areas that historically pre-COVID and now is, is math. And I'm glad Jessica's here because they've been doing a lot of work in collaboration, the math teams, we're part of a collaboration, California Ed Education Partners, and we've started an algebra project where teachers are getting together, they're getting professional experts across the country to help out, and then collaboration with other districts. And we've seen dramatic uh, growth already in the math. Uh, and just last year, we started a similar collaboration from preschool through grades three in math. We know math is a, is a challenge area for us as a district. So I'd say overall, I mean, Burbank Outstanding Schools, we know that. That's why um, pretty much everyone is tuning in today. But there's always opportunities for growth. And when we find those opportunities, we gather resources, either through grants, through BAEF, or through other partners like, partnerships like California Education Partners to help us move to the next level. Thank you. Um, in response to that, I was wondering if you could help just um, who do you see as the peer, who our peer districts are? Because I know some of the ones that were mentioned in the question are a little bit different, um, you know, in a monetary way, being with funding or even just support in their ed foundation. So when you think of peer districts, who are you thinking of? 
When we look at, uh, we actually, we look at all districts. So we're in members of different cohorts. So there's a tight uh, network of districts that is called Five Star. So that includes Glendale, Pasadena, South Pasadena, La Cañada, and Burbank. So we compare our pra best practices and our challenges with each other on a monthly basis. So that's one cohort of peers that we look at. I'm also a member of the LA County a, a group of superintendents, which includes all 80 superintendents in addition to the four that I just mentioned. Uh, but through this math collaborative and other collaboratives, we look at districts of similar size and similar demographics across the state to see how we're doing. Uh, but it doesn't mean we don't look at schools that raise more money than us or have more uh, money or schools that have uh, different demographics because we can still learn what's happening in the classroom from, from those as well. Absolutely. Thank you. And I just wanted to mention uh, there is a question in the chat that I have a question that um, addresses your question later. So I'm going to go on to our next question, which is for President Tabit. And this is from an elementary school parent. This year's board goals feel a little unamb unambitious. Why aren't we pushing for bigger wins? And what criteria will you use to determine if the district has met the board goals? Well, our board goals, the four goals, are aligned to the Local Control Accountability Plan, or LCAP, for those who participate um, on a regular basis. Uh, we review multiple metrics to determine if we have met those goals. And of course, we encourage everyone, whether you have a child in our school or not, to participate in the LCAP process. Uh, thank you, President Tabit. Um, where, and how do we report back on our progress of these board goals? How can the public know how we're doing? How are we measuring that? It's usually discussed at a board meeting or when we, um, it's part of how we evaluate the superintendent as well. So those can always be uh, asked for if someone's really interested in learning. Great. Yeah, maybe we could do an end of the year presentation on, on how we've done with our board goals and um, progress. I think that would be really exciting. And maybe we could help um, market that for you. So, yes. um, great. Well, um, OK, great. Um, we're going to be asking some questions for our amazing teachers. This is for Mrs. Garcia from a future BUSD's parent. I hear a lot about the dual immersion, but I don't really understand how it works, especially for families that don't speak the language. And if you have a child that's fluent, what are benefits of being in this program and how does that work? Oh, if you could just unmute yourself first. There we go. Hola, buenos, buenas noches. Hello, everybody. I'm Maestra Garcia. I teach at Disney Elementary School. I teach fourth grade. This is my sixth year in dual immersion at Disney, my 12th year in dual immersion in California. And I have more years um, so on the East Coast. Okay. So dual language gives your student an opportunity to acquire the global skill of bilingualism. This gives your child a competitive edge in the career and job market. Our program is 90-10, 90% English, 10% Spanish in kinder, and changes to 80, 20, 70, 30, et cetera, until you get to fifth grade where the program is 50%, 50% English, Spanish. The students will enter middle school as bilingual, biliterate students, Parents don't need to be fluent. Simply promote literacy in the language you speak at home because those skills transfer and strengthen acquisition in the target language, in this case, Spanish. For fluent or native speakers, dual immersion enhances their reading, writing, and speaking skills to go from a casual language proficiency to an academic level of mastery. It allows for additional language acquisition in high school and college. It works because subjects are taught in that language and not Spanish out of context. It makes the language proficiency authentic and on par with other countries who speak that language. It's an amazing program and it's very rigorous. It's a commitment 
but very rewarding. And I feel a necessary skill for future young people entering this today's workforce. I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Ms. Garcia, that did. Thank you very much. And there is a follow-up question actually that I came in and is gonna be directed to Dr. Hill. Is the district committed to the DI program? DI stands for dual immersion for anybody at home. We love a lot of acronyms in our district. And can we provide concrete examples of that commitment to DI? Thank you, Brenda. As, as Hildy just highlighted, we are absolutely committed to the dual immersion program. And for the community that doesn't know, we have it at two schools, Walt Disney Elementary, as well as McKinney, McKinley Elementary. So those two schools are led by amazing principals who collaborate with those teachers within the school, but also across the schools, the teachers get together. Uh, in addition, uh, there's opportunities for the articulation now up to Huerta Middle School. Dual immersion has progressed through Huerta and John Burroughs for this is the first year. Some things that the district and the board has done is make sure we prioritize that pathway as we're going all the way from TK all the way up to um, high school. Uh, we're looking at additional AP classes. Uh, so we have Spanish AP, but our uh, teachers are getting trained in AP Spanish Lit. So as students progress through, they have additional opportunities. And our partnership, a uh, dual enrollment partnership that I mentioned in the video with our community colleges that allows students to get to that next level of college Spanish level. So we want to make sure that our students have access to dual immersion all the way through our system. Uh, is there any plans to offer other languages, perhaps? At this time, we are not able to offer additional languages. That is a discussion that we've had at the, at the with school board and looking at it. There's a couple of factors reason why. One is making sure you have the classroom space to be able to provide that. Uh, second, making sure that we have the dedicated funding. So it does it is an investment that we're making. Uh, on behalf of the district and our Spanish dual immersion program to add another, another language, we would need those resources to do that. And then third is making sure you have teachers all the way through uh, in the program. So th those are some challenges when we look at other districts that have tried to expand to multiple languages. Uh, sometimes they can start at the elementary level, but when you get to the middle and the high school level, it's, it's more difficult to continue that on because you need uh, teachers. And we have the same challenge even in our Spanish program to teach the Spanish class, but also teach electives that have that Spanish credential as well. And just in California with limited resources, we just have to be cognizant of those, those challenges. So right now we're focused on Spanish. It's always a conversation we look to have, but there's no immediate plans to expand to different languages. Thank you. Um, our next question is for Mr. James, and it comes from an elementary school parent. It says, please share your thoughts on why arts education is important for all students. And we've heard you've collaborated with other teachers such as the costume design class and was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I'll start with the question of um, why is important for all students to have an opportunity to pursue art? School is challenging. There are a lot of things in the day that students have to do in order to further their learning, to further their academics. With an arts program, you allow that intellectual stimulation, but you also allow breath for creativity. And you give oxygen to those fires of the child's mind that might not be stimulated in other ways. We all know we have our own personal interests, the things that create passion within us. And the idea is that everyone has an artistic area that they can excel, that they can push themselves in. Now, it's also important to realize that one of the things that we have to do with the school district is support these kinds of fires, making sure that we have equal access across all of our school sites for any of these artistic areas. And I think that's something that BUST is definitely gonna be making a push for in the future. I'm, I'm the only middle school drama teacher that we have. We only have art programs at two of the middle schools. So we're really trying to make sure that we can you know, create the kind of funding through programs like uh, the Burbank Arts Education Foundation where, where we can have that sort of support. And maybe we can even go back to the community for some of that as well. So I also wanna say, as far as collaboration goes, um, I'm a very fortunate teacher in that my school site is filled with 
brilliant, innovative people. And there's no shortage of the ability to collaborate. And all one has to do with um, my fellow teachers at, in the Burbank School District is reach out and ask. Um, our costume design department, our costume teacher um, has a, a vast array of costumes that have been collected over the years uh, through she and her predecessor. Uh, her students uh, get to help pick and design and figure out what's gonna be the best look for each character, engaging their own creative output as well. Um, but it doesn't just extend, uh, it doesn't just stop rather uh, there at that costume design teacher. There's also the fact that um, the high school drama teacher, Donovan Clover and I have collaborated many times over the years in order to make connections between our students. Uh, even just the uh, sixth grade teachers uh, for my sixth grade class, I try to pair up my second semester with what they're studying in history class. So the theater traditions we look at pair with the students um, history uh, areas of the world that they're dealing with. So collaboration is um, important also because in the arts, they're a collaborative field. Uh, an actor needs an audience. Um, uh, you, you can't create a piece of art without expecting it to show, to show it to somebody, uh, to share it with somebody, uh, to get connect with somebody in some way. So that's another reason why collaboration is important. The arts teaches you to collaborate. Thank you, Mr. James. Well said. That was a great answer. I really appreciate all the thought. And I love um, Burbank. I do feel, at least for me, I'm a parent as well. And my, my kids have had that experience with collaboration throughout all their schooling so far. So I'm really grateful to be a part of that. Um, great. Well, my next question is for Ms. Pulaski, actually. And the question um, is about STEAM. And it says, with the push for STEAM, that includes math, how are we conveying to students that want to go to college and major in math the wide variety of job opportunities for math majors? Um, hi. So I saw it in the video, but at the high school level, we offer several NAF academies um, that highlight careers where math is really prominent. So Burbank High School has the Business Academy and both Burbank and John Burroughs High School have the Engineering Academy. Students take classes such as accounting, financial planning, engineering, physics, and those are all really math focused courses. In addition, when we teach our higher level classes like Algebra 2, Pre-Calculus, AP Statistics, AP Calculus, they often contain lessons that really showcase math in real life and what you can do with that math. I remember one year um, I was teaching my students concepts and we started talking about what those careers might look like um, an actuary, an aerospace engineer working for NASA, and even coming back and becoming a high school math teacher. I've had a lot of students um, who have gone and gotten their math degrees and have returned to the classroom, some even coming back to our district. We also offer things like our career tech education days at both high schools. We have college and career fairs, and we really showcase just the different pathways that students can take. Thank you, Ms. Pulaski. Um, I do have another math question, actually, um, from, this might be from me, actually. <laughs> um, and it says, what is the math track? And if your child starts accelerated math in middle school, but then decides they don't want to pursue math or science, what are other options in high school? Um, for me, I didn't realize that at the end of fifth grade, I would be making a decision that affected the next seven years of my child's education in mathematics. Can you speak a little bit to that? Of course. So the math pathway, the math track is math six, math seven, math eight, algebra one, geometry, algebra two, and then it gets a little, you can choose. You can go on to pre-calculus, you can take AP statistics, you can take ICM, intro to college math, 
Um, once you've completed pre-calculus, you can move on to AP Calculus AB. We also offer AP Calculus BC. So a lot of different courses um, in the math department for students. So they only need two years of math to graduate high school, three years of math to meet A through G requirements, but four years uh, are recommended. And so even if you're not your, your child is not going to be on this math or science path if they're hoping to attain A through G. Um, they really should be taking three, four recommended years of math. And I actually spoke with a counselor to make sure I got this right. But if a student decides when they enter high school, they really don't want to be on that accelerated path. Um, we do our best to help those students follow the appropriate progressions, if they have concerns about their pathway, they can talk with a counselor, they can review um, each student's progress on like a case by case basis. We know that every student is unique. So we want to support them um, in the best way possible. So at the high school level, a non accelerated track would be starting ninth grade in algebra one, moving on to geometry as a 10th grader. And then you could be done at that point. If you wanted to take a third year, you would continue on with Algebra 2. And then if you wanted to take a fourth year, you have a choice, either pre-calculus, AP Statistics, or ICM. Thank you, that was really helpful. I'm not sure where we're at right now, but we're, we're getting through geometry currently. <laughs> um, I appreciate your, your feedback. Um, I do have a question for Mr. James, um, and it asks, what strategies have you found that are successful in advancing children who have fallen behind academically? Well, one of my areas is academic intervention. It's uh, one of the elective classes that I teach, and it's oftentimes for students who have not elected to take that elective um, because we see that they need some, some help, some intervention. Um, the strategies that are best are honestly the same things that we see in art. It's communication. It's being willing to reach out and ask for that help. It's the strategies of developing a plan. It's goal setting. It's follow through. It's all of the things that we as adults oftentimes struggle with as well. But in a school situation, uh, it's like bumper bowling. Right? We have this opportunity to teach them now these skills so that way they can develop the good habits that I always tell them it took me until college to develop. I'm on their side and here to help them. Um, uh, bumper bowling is the, um, you know, the, where you have the protection on the lanes of either side of bowling where you won't hit a gutter ball, uh, that sort of thing. So this way they've got that protection uh, in order to make sure that there are no major consequences in middle school if a student is really, really struggling besides not learning the material, which is major consequence enough. It's not punitive, uh, it's not punishment, it's not cruel, uh, but it's a matter of saying to that student, we are here to help you. So that way, when you do get to that next level, when there might not be these guardrails, we want you to be able to succeed on your own. We're trying to set up this scaffolding, a term that is way overused in education, but we're trying to set up this scaffolding to protect you as you build yourself into the student that you're going to be. Thank you very much, Mr. James. I would like to actually take a question from the Q&A from our live audience. Um, and this is for Ms. Garcia and Dr. Hill, or, or uh, it says there is a long waiting list for the, DE, or the DI program, and how can they get their children um, down the list to get into it? So what advice might you have? Oh. <laughs> Ms. Garcia, you're on mute. Do you, yeah, you're... I. you think I would have figured this out during Zoom learning, and I told my kids to do that, but I forgot. Dr. Hill, I'm going to let you take this one because I think you're going to answer it so much better, but and, yeah. I'll chime in if I think there's something else I should say. Thank you. Unfortunately, there is no, uh, it's not an answer that I, I can give us a, a good answer on this one. We do have a very high demand for a dual immersion program. So the selection process is based on a lottery process. So there's no, it's not based on academic performance. There's no other criteria. 
the only criteria is if you're a native Spanish speaker or you're a native English speaker, sometimes we have had a need for more native Spanish speakers to join the program. So they get in off that lottery list uh, faster than if you are a native English speaker. Uh, Correct. It's because in a dual immersion program for it to work effectively, you want 50% of the kids to be native speakers and 50% of the kids to be um, maybe English only or from other countries or you know learning the target language of Spanish. That's how dual immersion works. It's not a bilingual one-way program. It's so that when you're modeling in Spanish, the kids that are native speakers can follow what's going on. The kids that are not native speakers pick it up quickly. Sometimes in those native speakers, you have children from other countries in Spanish who do not know any English. I've had that several years in a row. They've come from Colombia or Cuba. So then their English peers, when speaking in English, they're modeling the language. And now my Spanish only children are picking it up without breaking the code switch of the language. So then you truly get bilingual, biliterate children. That is the reason sometimes having the language a little bit stronger might help, but not always. Ms. Garcia, do you have any advice for any families that maybe were not, um, you know, awarded the lottery position? Like what, what kinds of things can their families do um, to incorporate learning a language in their house at an early age? Oh, okay. So put the captions on the TV in Spanish. Let your kids watch TV and they're reading the Spanish. You would be surprised how amazing the pickup of the language is. Studies have shown it. In Sweden, that is how um, the Swedish community has their children learn English by putting captions. I read that in a Harvard um, Business Review article. Also, Duolingo is a good program. There's lots of fun programs. Programs. There's great PBS programming that has a lot of language acquisition for students. Let them watch cartoons in Spanish from Univision or Telemundo because nothing picks up from watching, you know, you can pick it up very well. And um, enroll them in some of our parks and rec programs, have Spanish classes that are for little kids and, you know, play dates with like minded parents with someone that might want to be hired for Spanish and then they can play with the kids in Spanish. So, I mean, there's so many ways you can incorporate language, but just teach them that learning is beautiful, that all languages are great and provide them with books and uh, visual resources to those languages. And you'd be surprised how much your kids might get inspired. And my husband started languages in middle school, no Spanish in his household. He's fluent in five languages from high school or middle school to college, five languages, including Spanish, it's flawless. So if you want to learn a language, you can. Thank you, that's inspiring. Um, and also I know we uh, aren't expanding to other languages, um, but is there any, Dr. Hill, any um, plan to expand to other schools so we can make it a bigger program? Right now, we're not able to expand. If, if you look at our other elementary schools, we're utilizing all the classrooms. So again, you have to have a dedicated classroom at each grade level. So from TK, Disney doesn't have TK, but McKinley does, but kinder all the way up to fifth grade, you have to have that classroom and a teacher dedicated. So that's why we can't expand within the two schools or expand at another elementary school. But Hildy is absolutely correct. Is giving your child exposure to languages at the younger ages, we do offer Spanish at each of our middle schools so they can start taking Spanish in eighth grade and be on an accelerated path for high school so they can get it to AP Spanish and even AP Lit, even if you start at middle school instead of starting Absolutely. at TK eighth or Eighth grade kindergarten. with Spanish one, ninth grade Spanish two, Spanish three and 10th, and you have two years of AP. That's five years of a language in a rigorous program that our high school provides. You'd be surprised. I have students that are on those tracks and their Spanish is amazing, absolutely amazing and they did not have immersion. Awesome, thank you. Um, this is a question about STEM or STEAM in the elementary schools. Um, Ms. Garcia, maybe you could speak to it. And I'm also curious if Ms. Pulaski has anything to um, add to that. Um, and it, the question is, how are we integrating more STEAM opportunities for elementary school students? And then there is a question in the Q&A that is very similar to that. And it says if uh, any efforts are being made to integrate computer science um, and coding into the curriculum starting at the elementary level. So 
maybe Ms. Garcia, you could start with that. And I invite anybody to participate in this conversation if you have anything to add. I will, and I promise Nuri and Anna, I will not speak at my usual speed. <laughs> All right, so I can only speak for me at Disney, but I have been, and Dr. Hill knows, very passionate about science education in the elementary school for the last five years. And thanks to Charlene Walters, who's on your foundation, who was the PTA president who helped me start it, we've been able to do great things at Disney. We have a yearly science fair open from kindergarten to fifth grade. My vision, Dr. Hill, brace yourself, is that we do it at all the elementary schools so that we can then have a district-wide science fair winning competition and put us out there as a science leading district. I'm working on that. I've got another school interested, so maybe, but at least our school does it. Also, we used to do a science night and in the spirit of diversity, equity, and inclusion, we last year decided to do science day in school, rotating all the classrooms through 12 stations of science, um, physics, chemistry, biology, ecology, the whole nine yards, and not one child missed it. And that made my year because having children cry, leaving at it, at six from ACEs and not being able to stay in the evening for a science day made me feel like I needed to figure out a different way. So we do science day at school, all 400 students participate. This year, we're gonna throw out breakout rooms and escape rooms um, as be, well, because thanks to the Southern California Health Honda dealers, I was selected as their 2022 teacher of the year. I still am in shock, but their $5,000 grant created a STEM lab, STEAM lab for us. So we we're gonna have um, green screen, a Lego wall, coding mice for computer science, little bits for green screen and you know different things that you do for electricity. So all of the computer science components, everything in our STEAM lab. And our kids will be able to go to it weekly with their teachers. And I'm so excited, we're just getting it ready and I can't wait to share it with the whole BUSD community, but that was thanks to Helpful Honda. Science is important. Kids like me did not think we were smart growing up. We were Hispanic, we weren't smart. We would never have a future in a science or math world. If only this had been available to me, who would I have been? Because who I am now is definitely someone that loves science and math. And that was never successful at either. So I want to reach that community, those girls, that don't think they've got it. The boys and girls from all the countries that don't think they have the language, they do they have the mind. We just need to give them the access. So I think elementary school science should rock, should be STEAM for everybody, should be science for crazy, should be engineering designs. And then when they go to middle and high school, they're happy, they're explorers, they wanna learn. And then those teachers have students they can guide to those pathways. Take it away, Jessica. I'm not super familiar with uh, the going ons at the elementary school, but I do, um, I have worked with, through the algebra project, um, Jennifer Almer, and we've talked a lot just about the mathematics at the elementary level and really improving uh, students understanding, improving students mindset around mathematics. Um, something happens around third grade where they become, students start to think I'm no longer good at math or math is not, I'm not a math person. And that is so not true. So with the algebra project, we're really trying to build up um, their, their mindset around math. And I know that that is happening at the elementary level. As far as uh, coding, I don't know. I know we offer it at high school. We offer, um, I believe, AP Computer Science. Um, we have digital apps classes. Um, that, so hopefully we can bring it to the elementary schools. Jessica, yeah. we do, code. oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Hill, go ahead. I was gonna say no, we do coding ahead. mice, which are great in elementary and Scratch, which is a great program for our young learners and they are they love it and they're so good at it. So by the time they get older, they are already excited about that um, subject. 
I was just going to highlight this is the amazing part of having grants and amazing foundation partners. So a couple of years when we did our 90 for 90, each of our elementary schools got steam carts where they had supplies and they were able to start coding. BAEF continually year after year invest in school sites. So you see at the middle school level where they invest in coding as well as robotic clubs. And then we have district wide that's been expanded is the Young Sheldon grants. And that's from the Chuck Lorre Family Foundation that over the last three years district wide, I believe, and four years, uh, we had a focus at the secondary level where we have iPads at the elementary level where they have access to be able to do coding. They have these little robots that can be programmed called Osmos. And yes. our, you Those see as great. young as four and five-year-olds learning the circuits and coding at that level. So I just want to do a big plug again, like your investment in BAEF to be able to give these grants out to our, our teachers that want to do more with STEAM and STEM in the classrooms, it has a direct impact right away. And then that also attracts other foundations like the Chuck Lorre Foundation to do it more district wide. And so it, it's just, you see that you saw in the video and you can hear in the voices of our teachers, when we start talking about these innovative ideas, they love it. And just a little investment will go a long way. And I know Absolutely. Stephen wanted to jump in and talk about what they're doing at Muir. Uh, yes, I know that uh, we have at Muir, Amy Prosser teaches a uh, coding class as well as digital media. So STEAM is alive and well at the middle school uh, as well. But I do want to remind folks that because of the structure of our school day and because of the options that students have for an elective, they get one elective. So essentially they get STM or S-E-M, or S-A-M, uh, <laughs> because we don't give them those, we don't have the opportunities for them to pursue more than one thing. Essentially, a student does have to wind up picking their passion, uh, and it would be great if we could uh, just, you know, be a little um, uh, unconventional with our school day and allow students more than one elective. Uh, that way, they could pursue dual passions. Well said. I love this conversation. How exciting. Um, I'd like to move on to um, that we have some questions about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I think this one is for, well, there, there are a lot of these questions. And Dr. Hill, I want to think this is for you or um, President Tabit. But what is the update um, on DEI? And is the DEI consultant going to return? Will there be site DEI coordinators? And what are your expectations of their responsibilities? I'll go ahead and take the lead on this. And Shar, feel free to jump in if I, if I leave anything out. Uh, so just for uh, acronyms, I'll make sure I'm very clear. DEI is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, that's the work that we've been doing to make sure every child, every, every employee, every family member can bring their full selves to school every single day. I mean, that's my simple definition of what we're doing. There's a lot of specific areas that we've been working on. Last year, we did have a consultant that was working with us to do a base level assessment, be able to start to help provide support to the district office team, as well as the school sites. Uh, that contract ended and uh, she has moved on to other opportunities. But what we focus on for this year is we are making sure that we're building on the work that we did last year with um, facing history in ourselves. That gave our teachers a base level of uh, professional development around diversity, equity, and inclusion. We also did a training with the California Teachers Association about implicit bias. What we're doing this year is we'd like to have each school site have DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion leads. Uh, Nuri and Anna, I get passionate about this. So raise your hand if you want me to slow down. So I want to make sure our translators, I'm, I'm keeping up with them. Um, and so each school site, and we're going to start that process this month where school sites will vote on who their DEI leads are for their school site. We're going to provide uh, opportunity or release time so that they can um, work with the district office team, work with themselves, or bring in some consultants to help them so that they are going to be working at each school site to set goals. What is the DEI goal based at that school site that the whole school wants to work on and move forward? Uh, we've also just uh, brought on a consultant, Ebony Williams, that's focused on trauma-informed practices and understanding racially inclusive classrooms and pedagogy. 
So she's going to be doing two part trainings uh, for all staff. The first will be a virtual at your own pace with some of the foundational principles that all of our employees need and what are the, some of the tools you can do. After that, our staff will take a survey and then she's going to do face to face training at the school site so that our teachers, our support staff and say, here's a situation I had. How can what tool could I use to address this? Uh, how do I share with my colleagues about that? So really excited about the diversity, equity, inclusion work. I saw there's a question in the chat too around uh, we are expanding our curriculum to make sure we have more diverse curriculum that represents all of our students. And so that's a process that we're working with our English teachers this year to expand uh, the, the core novels and supplemental novels in our school sites. So there's a lot more to talk. Uh, we're continuing to give updates throughout the year, but I wanted to give you some highlights of the work we're doing there. Thank you very much. Um, I just realized that my Q&A is much longer. Uh, I don't have my whole window open and there's lots of stuff in there. Um, thank you for that answer. And um, I actually, this is part of the evening where um, if you wouldn't mind Dr. Hill just hanging out a little bit longer for some of these questions. And I would like to just thank you so much to Ms. Pulaski, Ms. Tabit, um, Ms. Garcia, and Mr. James for joining us this evening. And um, your, I really appreciated all that you had to engage in this conversation. And thank you for just the incredible work that you're doing to inspire our students here in BUSD. So, Thank you very much. You're free to go and I'll stick around with Dr. Hill. Okay. Um, and so some of the last questions, there were quite a few. Um, I just wanted to kind of dive in. Um, is the question that I have is um, there, well, in the chat um, about the superintendent and the president, um, basically, oh no, that's the wrong one. I'm very sorry. Um, in the leadership for yourself, Dr. Hill, equipping our principals with the necessary recruitment, hiring, retaining critical help to support their teachers and resource personnel. And I was wondering if you could speak to that. As we're seeing uh, across, across all sectors, uh, not just education, uh, there's a lot of turnover of staff right now. I think through uh, COVID and the pandemic, and President Tab and I were talking about this, and she had a good point of after a major event like 9-11, a lot of people reflected on personal and professional goals and where they are and said, where do they want where to go next? And I think we're seeing that across the country right now, across the world, that people are really reflecting where do they want to live? Where do they want to work? Uh, what are those opportunities? So there's a lot of amazing opportunities. We have a lot of amazing teacher support staff, administrators that we're seeing get promotions within the district, but also without, outside the district. So what we need to be cognizant of is how do we continue to be competitive um, salary wise? I mean, that's a conversation that's been ongoing. Uh, California, high cost place to live. Uh, funding, as was mentioned in the video, is a, it's a low funding for public education. Uh, and then in Burbank, uh, the resources we get, we know it's a challenge. So we have to continue to forge those partnerships. And I'm reading through the Q&A and I say, well, what are some of those partnerships that we have? Uh, the Board of Education has done an amazing job of having strong partnerships with our elected officials. And that's at the state and the local level. And so you saw videos from Senator Portantino, Assembly Member Laura Friedman, Captain Barger at um, supervisor level, and in our own city council, uh, I saw a nice uh, shout out from Mayor Talamantes of just, it, I think it was one of the mention of Burbank is unique. Uh, I think Alexa said it in the video is because people are so invested and committed to Burbank. And so having those partnerships and being able to share the great work that we are doing, like we did tonight, but also be honest about the challenges we have. How does lack of funding and how is Burbank unique and how does that funding impact us? So highlighting that and then being creative on strategies, whether it's through fundraising and grants, whether it's through advocacy at the state level, I encourage everyone uh, that's uh, watching tonight to make sure that you look at Ed 100 and learn about how schools are funded, learn how to advocate, join PTA, partner with BEA, BAF. So our voices are loud and say that we need ongoing funding because it does work. We are seeing right now historic investments in public education. I wasn't able to say that three years ago, but with 
the pandemic. We saw investment to help us get through the pandemic. And this year we're seeing one-time funding so that we can do expanded learning as well as learning loss. But we wanna be strategic on how we use that funding at one time, but give us three to four years to show how we can invest that money and get results for our kids and then make that ongoing. So uh, we will be sharing more of that from the board and the superintendent staff level over the next couple of months. Uh, but we know we need to be competitive. Uh, but I do encourage you, we've, we've lost some amazing talent in this district, but we've also been able to promote and recruit amazing talent as well. So if you haven't met some of uh, our new administrators, our new teachers, our support staff, I encourage you to reach out at your school site. They are amazing individuals. They will knock your socks off. You're gonna be really pleased uh, about the talent that we have in Burbank. Uh, thank you. Speaking about that, um, I know uh, we did have a, several questions just about, and, and you know, I was looking at the board goals from previous years, and it, it does seem a theme that um, it is to attract and retain um, quality teachers, staff, administrators. And we have had quite a few, um, you know, leave our district uh, recently. What are the plans of, um, you know, with the retaining part? And and I know you spoke a lot about the attracting part, but how about re the retaining? Can you speak anything to that? Yeah. Retain it, and that's an opportunity to use the, the one-time funding as well as they where do our employees feel like they're just overworked, don't have the support they need? So we're gonna be having those conversations community-wide about where can we make strategic investments with the one-time funding to provide that support for individuals that felt overwhelmed in their roles. Second is well, how can we be more competitive uh, with compensation? We went several years where we gave zero to uh, a very small amount of compensation increases. So our employees were seeing inflation going up, Sorry, uh, we have our amazing Burbank Fire Department going by right now. Um, but you saw inflation going up, you saw healthcare costs going up, but our wages weren't. This past year, we were able to give a 5% raise to our employees because we, we did have to tighten our belts and make cuts over the last couple of years to stabilize our budget. We did that. This year with the state money that we have, we need to look at how can we give a competitive raise again this year. So it has to be, it's a couple fold. Make sure that people feel supported and valued in the work that they're doing. And second is, as much as possible, how can we uh, give competitive wages? Yeah, the, there was actually a question in the Q&A about, um, you know, uh, if there was any support for staff members who wanted to pursue higher education or admin training. Um, and obviously that costs money, but that could be, you know, a great use of those funds too, those one-time funds. Um, great. Okay. So there was a question that came in about, um, where did it go? Um, just school safety. You had mentioned in the video how important, um, safety is a priority to you personally. And, um, I know, can, if you, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the SRO, um, uh, which is a school resource officer. Am I right? SRO? Okay. Yeah. Um, at, uh, Burbank High and it, there was some questions about, not knowing if they were full-time or if there was one or two. Could you speak a little bit more about that? Absolutely. So first, uh, I don't know if they're on, but if Chief Albanese is watching, just to thank you again. Uh, last Wednesday, and we do this every single year, we have the Burbank Police Department come with their senior leadership team, uh, make sure they're inter doing introductions to our principals, making sure we have a face with the, the phone call in, in, the, in the email that we have. We are very fortunate here in Burbank. Like, I can pick up the call, my phone and call Chief Albanese at any time. He's going to answer. And that's our principal is able to reach out Burbank Police Department. So we know that the response time across Burbank for residents is usually around three minutes or so. For our school, it's even less. Like we have support from the Burbank Police Department like no other uh, district, in my opinion. Uh, as far as the school resource officer program, so they we do have a, a school resource officer. They support all the schools. And I think that you mentioned the question is, is a disc dedicated for one high school? Uh, the school resource officer, uh, they, they support all of our schools. So they don't they don't just visit one school. We don't have a full-time person at one school. But if there's um, suspected child abuse issues, they will come out to the school site and help out. If we have any emergency issues there, come out. We also work with the entire juvenile division if we need to bring in detectives or if there's potential alleged threats or anything. So they are there working with us on those incidents if we need them, so we call them. In addition, 
they are focused on helping us with uh, educational programs. So in the past, we've partnered with our mental health providers, uh, as well as the school resource officers to talk about the harms of vaping and what to look for as parents, what to look for as students understand that. So educational opportunities are another uh, opportunity where we engage with Burbank Police Department. Uh, I'll put a plug in September 22nd. We're partnering with uh, Burbank Council PTA, Family Service Agency of Burbank, as well as the Burbank Police Department to do a safety se uh, seminar. So we're going into a lot more detail about the work we're doing around keeping our staff and students safe. Thank you. Um, and I'm sure there's probably a lot of training too um, for school sites that are in collaboration with the police department. Is that true? Correct. Yeah. Um, great. So there was a question that's kind of a, a fun thing to think about is driver's ed um, and education program. Um, I guess there was, let's see, last year a driver's ed program or assembly was brought back for ninth graders in their health class. Um, and it, they would like you to talk about that and make the, how do we make the community aware of that? And then is there something that they can do for the other, other grades? Um, and then what happens like after that? Is that gonna continue or? Uh, unfortunately, a tragic event spurred this on. Uh, we've done a lot of drive uh, safe um, seminars, education workshops with our students over the years. But when we had the tragic accident, uh, the high speed crash on Glen Oaks, uh, it was probably the next day, uh, Chief Albanese reached out to the school district, uh, President Tabbitt and myself and Dr. Paramo and said, what can we do from an education standpoint? There's things that you can do to try to slow down drivers, but it really starts at education and how do we make sure everyone's aware? So we partnered with the Burbank Police Department uh, over the course of last year and our health teachers to have interactive safe driving segments built into our health classes. And <laughs> this was an opportunity for students to really, in ninth grade, we chose ninth grade in health, that all students are getting that information. It's before they're getting their driver permits. So as far as expanding other grades, we wanna focus on that because we wanna captivate students when they are thinking about driving or getting in the car with another student. And that's so that's why we're focused on that. We wanna continue to have that partnership. So we're gonna talk through uh, that this year with our police department and our health teachers. Great, I think that's a great idea. Um, I know there's a question in the Q and A about efforts um, being to wait, being advanced to limit classroom sizes. If you could speak to that, I'm assuming they're they're probably talking about um, fourth grade up. Maybe is when they get a little bigger. And so for. Um, our class size ratios for transitional kindergarten through third grade, uh, our average is 24 to one. Uh, when you get up above that uh, at the middle school and high school, uh, district-wide we do an average of 30.5. Now that means some classes are averaging 34, 36, others are smaller, your PE classes and your other electives can be much larger than that, but the average is around 30.5. Uh, our secondary, secondary, when I mean secondary, middle and high school, those averages are lower than our uh, peer districts, like a Glendale and the Pasadena and the others I talked about as well. Given the funding we're having um, in Burbank, I don't see an opportunity to reduce class sizes even more, but I will say what we've done with declining enrollment over the last couple of years with the COVID money, the stimulus funding, so this one-time funding, if with declining enrollment and then rather than having a reduction of teachers as many uh, that could qualify based on those ratios we've kept some of those and it's over 20 teachers so that we do have lower class sizes but unfortunately that won't be a long-term strategy uh, with uh, just one-time funding uh, the good news with enrollment though good and bad, which will balance that class size back up to the 24 to 1 and the 30.5 is our enrollment this year is actually the same, it looks like it may come in higher than last year. So we're seeing a reversal of that decline in enrollment. And I think it's because we're, you, you saw it, people are excited to come back to school. They're seeing the innovative programs. We're getting out of the online and the homeschool and the, and the online charter type environment. Uh, families are coming back to Burbank. Yeah, that's great. That is exciting. Um, I, there was a question about um, if there was any chance of maybe restructuring our school day to have seven periods and where students then could take two electives. Is that ever 
a conversation that you're having? So we have each year, or not each year, but each school site has an opportunity to look at their schedules. So over the last couple of years, and this past year, our high schools looked at their schedules uh, based on uh, the later start time, uh, Senator Portantino's bill. So we, we now have an 8.30 start time for our high school students. So you can look at uh, the traditional six day period. You, they've looked at seven, uh, seven periods. You also look at block scheduling. There's a lot of pros and cons to each of those scheduling models. There's not a uniform, this is the best schedule. Otherwise we'd see that across LA, across the country of what model. Our teachers get together with our principals and we talk about the pros and cons. When they're doing any schedule change, they also get uh, student and parent feedback. Uh, so as we've looked through those different scheduling options, our schools have seen that the six period day is working best for our students right now. Thank you. Um, this, there, oh, there was a question in the chat about, um, where is it? Uh, can, uh, there's only one or two after school uh, programs for kindergartners with very limited spots and the bell schedule is very inconvenient for working parents. Um, has this issue been addressed or thought through um, any plans to help alleviate some of that stress? I'm trying to, I caught a part of that. I missed the first intro. So I'm trying to pull up the question or can you say it again? I couldn't see. I know. <laughs> I think it's. On, hold on one second. Um, I think it got dismissed pretty quickly. It could be okay. There's only one or two after-school programs for kindergartners with very limited spots, um, and then there's the bell schedule. So it's kind of a two-part question. Gotcha. So it's uh, childcare. So if what we've looked at, we have partnerships. So we have around the bell. And we are able to have as many classrooms as what's available. We don't always have classroom space available. Uh, and so that's one challenge. So we, and then two is make sure we have the right staffing for childcare. So we, we do know that is a, a high need uh, for families. Uh, we do partner with the YMCA, Boys and Girls Club, and the city through after school days, ASD for childcare options. So if you're looking at it around the bell and that's full, there's other options that we encourage you to look at. They still have the same challenge of hiring as well as classroom space. We just don't have excess classroom space, especially for kindergarten, because they get out at an earlier time where uh, families can go. Uh, so, but please look at our website if you haven't reached out to those other organizations, but we do know that is a challenge in our community. Um, yeah, thank you. And I was glad I was able to find that question again. Um, and then it, I just going back to uh, the education of teachers who want to become administrators. Um, it, it, the question was, will BUSD support and help pay for that education? So right now we, we don't have the funding for that. Uh, some other districts, there's some one time funding called educator effectiveness funding. Uh, we've been investing at in other areas, for example, um, our Title II, which is the Federal Resource and Educator Effectiveness, we use for our mentorship program, as well as an induction for our new teachers. So our, our investment right now has been focused on new teachers and teachers that need additional support. We haven't had the resources to be able to pay for uh, teachers wanting to, or other employees wanting to go get their credential or get their admin credential. So we, we don't have that um, opportunity right now in the district. Thank you. I think that was um, clear. Was, and, sorry, will, well, ahead, and there's the ahead. administrator uh, credential. I did want to put a, a plug in uh, that we've had pre-COVID. We did have an aspiring administrators program in the district, and that is something we do want to bring back. So that allows um, anyone that's aspiring to be an administrator so they have a cohort model that's supported through our HR department, our human resources department. That is something we want to bring back. But as far as getting that credential, we don't have the resources to pay for individuals um, to get their credential. OK, great. Um, my son is in middle school at John Muir. Today, they got a $5,000 grant for a music program, which is great. However, their numbers have tripped uh, since a few years ago. Is there a budget left for the symphonic band and or the jazz band? 
I'm going to have to ask that individual to reach out to the, uh, the principal, Dr. Miller. Uh, it's very specific, so I, I don't know uh, yeah. the numbers where the grant is. So I apologize, I can't answer that one right now. And this is a great, just a reminder that all, all these questions that we've either answered, we're going to go back through and, and you know post the answers. So that's very clear. It's kind of hard to do it live here. Um, okay. And there's one last question about um, D, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion for our students, um, but staff are not feeling supported um, with the religious holidays. Um, and we excuse students for religious holidays, but the staff, I guess, are feeling penalized for that. Um, and they're wondering if you could speak to that and the equitability of that. So right now, uh, employees have, uh, personal necessity days, and that comes out of their sick time, but it's a PN day or personal necessity day that they can use. We have heard from employees that they would either like the district to designate some of those days as local holidays, so they don't have to use the PN days or add in more. So that comes down to a calendaring challenge, or it would be a financial challenge to be able to provide additional professional necessity days. So. That is a topic that has come up over the years and it's something that's been revisited, but we haven't um, reached an agreement on where we would go moving forward. Okay, great. Um, well, Dr. Hill, thank you so much for spending this extra time with me um, and all of our participants this evening. Um, I appreciate your conversation and I'm sure we'll continue these talks as the year goes on and I'm excited for next year's State of the Schools and to be able to highlight some of the growth and um, incredible things that our district's doing. So thank you so much. Thank you everybody for joining us. And um, you can always um, go to baef.gives um, if you'd like to help support the foundation and the work that we're doing, or just to reach out and um, get involved. So we're excited for that. We welcome that. Thank you so much and have a great evening, everybody. Thank you all, have a great evening.